uh, for the uh, okay <laughs> invitation to this seminar. Today's talk will be about bilinear rope singular integrals, which are actually uh, bilinear extensions of singular integrals with rope kernel. We will actually study the LP1 times LP2 to LP boundedness of this bilinear operator, and we'll uh, introduce the most recent development on this object. And this talk is based on the joint work with Dan Chin Ha. Okay, this is the outline of my talk. I will first show you some classical research for the linear rope singular integral operators. And then uh, we look at some bilinear extensions that are recently established. Then I will show you the main result here. And then we will explicitly prove our main result in this two part. Then at the end of this talk, I would like to discuss some open problems. Okay, let's get started. Uh, omega is a function defined on the sphere s to the m minus one. And then we define the corresponding singular integral operator L omega as the integral of omega over y to the n times f of x minus y. So here omega has the variable y prime, which means y over absolute value of y. So it is on the unit sphere. And this function omega is an integrable function with mean value zero property. Then the operator L omega uh, was first studied by Calderon and Zygmunt in 1956. They proved that uh, when omega belongs to L of L, then the operator is bounded in LP for P between one and infinity by using the method of, of rotations. And then this result was uh, improved by Huifman and Weiss in 1977 who replaced the space L of L, a larger one. So hard space H1 here. And then exactly the same estimate was also obtained by Connett two years later. And then uh, as an endpoint estimates for the case P is equal to one, uh, Chris and Rubio de Francia in 1988, they proved that when omega is an LQ function, then the operator is a weak type one one. But this result covers only two dimensional case. And independently, Hoffman also obtained the same estimate in two-dimensional case. And this result uh, has been improved and generalized to all dimensions by Seeger in 1996 uh, by using a different but much more much simpler method. He actually proved that when omega is in L log L, which is exactly the same as the condition in the result of this Calderon and Zygmunt. Then the weak type 1, 1 boundedness is still true. Uh, we have these inclusions. So the hard space H1 is larger than L log L, and then LQ space is the smallest one for Q greater than 1. We also have additional results by Duan de Coexia and Rubia de Francia in 1986 and Sigur and Tao in 2001. Uh, those are applications and improvements of some uh, previous results but I do not wanna discuss them in detail here. And I think all of you are familiar with those materials or have studied them at least once. So rather than discussing the linear case further, uh, let's focus on the new materials about bilinear operators. Okay, now let's consider the bilinear operator. Uh, now let omega is a function defined on the sphere as to the two n minus one, we have two here with the vanishing moment condition. Then the bilinear singular integral operator is defined similarly. So it is integral of omega over y to the two n times f1 of x minus y1, f2 of x minus y2 here. So it is a bilinear extension of the linear operator. And then uh, it is well defined for any Schubert functions f1 and f2 here. When it define the kernel k as this function, so this is our kernel k, then the operator can be also written as this convolution operator. So k convert with the tensor product of f1 and f2. In that case, the variable would be two x variables. Then the main question is, what about LP1 times LP2 to LP boundedness of this operator? when pj's and p satisfy this conjugate condition. 
The first result about this bilinear estimates is due to Koifman and Mayer in 1975. They proved that the operator uh, L omega is bounded from LP1 times LP2 to LP in one dimensional case. So the function is defined on the real line now. If omega is of bounded variation on the circle. But in this case, we have one more restriction. P should be greater than one here. The general dimensional cases are studied by Grafakos and Tress in 2002. They actually proved this boundedness is true if omega is a Lipschitz function on the sphere by using a bilinear T of one theory. And these two results, in these two results, omega is a bounded variation or Lipschitz function. So they cover omega with some smoothness, but our main interest is the case when omega is completely rough. So then let's look at the next two results, which, which deal with uh, the rough kernel. So in 2018, Grafakos, He, and Honzik proved that when omega is an L infinity function, then the operator is bounded from LP1 times LP2 to LP. Moreover, in 2020, uh, Grafakos, He, and Slavikova, they uh, improved the previous estimate. So actually replace this LQ norm, uh, L infinity norm by LQ norm here for Q greater than four over three. However, in this case, the ranges of P1 and P2 and P are much more restrictive here. So please look at this picture. Uh, in the first result, uh, on the whole region, the operator norm is bounded by L infinity norm. But in the second uh, result, it is improved, but uh, we have, I mean, P1 and P2 are between two and infinity and P is between one and two. This is equivalent to the point one over P1 and one over P2. It is on this right triangle. So on this triangle, it is bounded by LQ norm for Q greater than four over three. Now uh, let's look at the following theorem, which is actually the main result of this talk. It provides the generalization and improvements of the previous two results. So P1 and P2 are between one and infinity and P is between one half and infinity. And now we suppose that uh, Q is greater than maximum of four over three and P over two P minus one. Then when omega is an LQ function, then the operator is bounded with the norm LQ norm of omega here. So please look at this picture. Uh, the last one indicates the range of Q in this result. So compared with the first one, we have a refined estimate because our Q is finite. Compared with the second one, we extend the P1 and P2 naturally to the whole range because on the same reason, we have exactly the same estimate. So in the rest of this talk, uh, we will explicitly prove uh, this main result. Okay. Let's first look at some reduction step for the proof by using dyadic decomposition by re to the Pelli cutoff functions. So we first uh, define the function phi to be a Schubert function defined on R2n satisfying these properties, this one and this one. So the free transform of phi is supported in the annulus of size one and the sum of Vj hat is equal to one where Vj is defined by the standard dyadic scaling here. So these functions are actually due to the Pelli functions. Then by using those, uh, we decompose the kernel K as the sum of K gamma here, which is equal to the product of these two functions. It is clear that each K gamma has compact support in the annulus of size two to the minus gamma because of this property. Moreover, we also observed that uh, the kernel K is uh, homogeneous of degree minus two N. So K is equal to two to the two gamma N times K of two to the gamma times Y. And this implies K gamma can be written as two to the two gamma N times K zero of uh, two, two to the gamma Y here. So that is a simple uh, computation. Moreover, for any integers mu, we further decompose the kernel k gamma by taking this convolution, V 
piece of mu plus gamma, which is equal to the other two expressions here. And then we define the new kernel k mu by taking this sum of gamma here. So in this process, we, we originally have this kernel, but we first decompose this kernel based on the compact support, uh, I mean the of size two to the minus gamma. And then by taking this convolution, we further decompose here. Then by uh, taking this sum, we define the new kernel here. Now we define uh, the corresponding operator L mu, which has the kernel K mu here. Then it is clear that the original operator L omega can be written as the sum of the new operator L mu. And accordingly, we have the uh, operator norm of L omega is bounded by the sum of the operator norm of L mu here. So instead of estimating the original operator L omega, we will investigate the behavior of the L mu, which is relatively uh, much easier. So our actual goal is uh, to obtain this operator norm is bounded by two to the minus delta times the absolute value of mu times LQ norm of omega for some positive number delta. So it is a kind of some uh, decay. Then by taking the sum over mu, uh, definitely the sum of this number should be finite. Then what's left is this operator norm is bounded by simply LQ norm of omega as we, des as we desired. So let's prove uh, our goal here, this blue estimate. Okay. For the case when mu is negative number, we need the following proposition, which is a bilinear uh, Mihulin uh, multiplier theorem. So multiplier sigma that is defined on the, on the space R2n, it satisfies all derivatives of sigma up to the degree 2n uh, is bounded by some constant a times c to the minus alpha. Then, so we call this one bilinear Mihulin's condition. Then the corresponding bilinear multiplier operator T sigma, which is defined in this integral. So integral of sigma times F1 hat times F2 hat. Of course, they have different variables. Times e to the two pi i x, the sum of C1 and C2. So it is a natural bilinear extension of the classical linear multiplier operator. So when sigma satisfies this bilinear Mihulin's condition, then the bilinear multiplier operator is bounded from LP1 times LP2 to LP with the bound A. It is actually the constant appeared here. So in the, I mean, the original version of the, I mean, Koifman and Mayer requires much stronger condition actually. Uh, it means all derivatives satisfy this condition, but that is, it is not that difficult to restrict the degree here. So in this talk, we will use this proposition. Then we apply this proposition by setting here the sigma is equal to k mu hat here. So in order to check this Mullins condition, we have to uh, check the behavior of the derivatives of k mu hat, which will be handled in uh, this slide. So this is the definitions of k's. And then we notice that Duan de Quexia and Rubia de Francia show that if Q is between one and infinity and delta is any number less than one over Q prime, then we have these two estimates. So K zero hat is bounded by LQ norm of omega times the minimum of C and C to the minus delta. But when we differentiate, we have different second part. So in this case, minimum of one and C to the minus delta. Uh, here, we notice that this Q is any numbers between one and infinity. And these two estimates imply the following two estimates with some uh, computation. So K mu hat is bounded by minimum of two to the mu and two to the minus delta mu. It follows from just this condition times LQ norm of omega. But when it differentiate, it is bounded by minimum of two to the mu uh, alpha and two to the mu two n minus delta times uh, this one here. 
So when it defines sigma is equal to k mu hat, it definitely satisfies the previous condition, I mean the Mihulin's uh, condition, uh, with the constant a is equal to 2 to the mu. This is because uh, this minimum is uh, definitely less than 2 to the mu. This is also less than 2 to the mu when mu is negative number. So our constant is 2 to the mu times LQ number of omega. Then by using the previous proposition, then this multiply operator is bounded from this space to this space with the constant 2 to the uh, mu times LQ number of omega. But we already know that this multiply operator is same as the operator L mu. So it is bounded by uh, this constant here when mu is negative number. So by taking this sum over negative number, because we have two to the mu here, we can take out uh, LQ number of omega outside of the sum. Then what's left is just the sum of two to the mu times this power. But since mu is negative number, this sum is definitely finite. So that is bounded by LQ number of omega. In this case, Q is any number. So what's left is just to estimate the terms for mu is positive number. So our actual goal, this estimate can be reduced to the inequality that this operator norm is bounded by two to the minus delta zero mu. So we have exponential decay here when mu is positive number. This times LQ norm of omega. This is our actual goal right now. Indeed, in the paper of Grapakos, He, and Hunzik, they proved that this operator is bounded from L2 times L2 to L1 with some exponential decay here times L2 norm of omega. Then this clearly implies the original operator is bounded in the same spaces with this uh, constant here, L2 norm of omega. Moreover, by using the bilinear calderon sigmund theory of the Grapakos and Tress, with the, this initial estimate and some interpolation technique, uh, we can also show that there exists some very, very small number delta zero, such that for any P1 and P2, so in general case, uh, we have this estimate as well. But we should notice that in this case, we have L infinity number here. Compared with the uh, previous one, uh, we have weaker one here. But this appeared in the constant of the size estimate and smoothness condition from this calderon sigmund theory. So in this case, for general P1 and P2, we, it requires the L infinity norm, not L2 norm. So then this implies the original operator, uh, this operator norm is bounded by L infinity norm, norm of omega here. So actually in this paper, there are two different main results. The first one is this initial estimate with L2 norm. For general case, we have L infinity norm here. Okay. Uh, in another paper, Grafakos and Slavikova in 2020, they improved the initial estimate by replacing here L2 norm by LQ norm here. Q is greater than four over three. And then, by using duality and interpolation method, they can generalize this estimate to P1 and P2 satisfying this condition. As I said before, this range is just on this right triangle. So then we have still exponential decay here with the same range of Q. So let's look at the, this idea, duality and interpolation argument in detail here. Uh, in order to use this duality argument, we first define transpose, which is a bilinear version of the other joint operator. So we first define the first transpose by exchanging the first function f1 and g here. Similarly, we can also define the second transpose by exchanging this one and g. Then by using the similar argument here, we can also obtain the boundedness of the uh, transposes. So uh, this operator norm is bounded by this one with the same decay here. And we also have the, another one here. So please look at this picture. 
from this initial estimate, so from here, we have the result at this point. And then from the uh, first, first one here, we have the result here by using duality argument. And from the second one, we obtain the result at another vertex layer. Now by using interpolation, I mean by linear interpolation method, we may obtain the result at this triangle. But since they have the same decay, I mean, they all of them have, the, uh, have decay. So we also have decay to, to the minus delta mu times LQ number of omega here. That is the idea in this paper. Okay. Now let's prove our main result. Uh, we assume Q is greater than maximum of these two numbers, four over three and P over two P minus one. Then we need to prove that there exists some very small positive number, delta zero, such that this operator norm is bounded by two to the minus delta zero mu. So we have some decay here times the sum of, I mean, the LQ norm of omega here. Then by taking the sum over mu greater than zero, we definitely know that the sum of this decay is finite. Okay, uh, now we divide the proof of this estimate into three different parts based on the range of, I mean, the location of P1 and P2. So this is our first re region, so region one. That is our second one, this triangle. And the last one is simply just the line. But the estimate on this line follows immediately from interpolation between the estimate, be, uh, estimate in those two regions here and here. So actually we can ignore the last part and let's focus on just the first two parts. Uh, in this case, in region one, the condition on Q would be actually Q is greater than four over three. But for the second one, we still need these two uh, values, maximum of these two values. Now let's look at the first region. Uh, first, recall that when P1 and P2 are between two and infinity, and P is between one and two, then we already have this estimate. So in this, on this right triangle, we have this decay two to the minus delta mu times LQ number of omega here. Now we will actually prove the, uh, the following proposition, which provides the estimate at these three end points. 0, 0, and 1, and 0, and 0, and 1. Uh, this weak type estimate give us the, uh, the result at these two endpoints, 1 and 0, and 0 and 1. And this BMO estimate uh, gives us just the uh, estimate at this point, 0 and 0. Then interpolating all results on this right triangle and at these three endpoints, we may obtain the result on this tr uh, triangle here. But here we should notice that uh, the, at these three endpoints, we have some exponential growth, not decay. However, this epsilon can be, uh, can be chosen sufficiently small, I mean, arbitrarily small, while this delta is some fixed number. So by taking this epsilon very, very small number, by interpolating, we actually obtain exponential decay still here, okay? So this delta zero is very small number and it depends on P1 and P2. So we cannot take this delta zero uniformly on, the, on this triangle. It should be determined separately at each point. Anyway, we have exponential decay, so we are done here. So let's prove this proposition. And uh, this talk, I would like to focus on just weak time estimate. And if you are interested in the BMO estimate, please uh, refer to my recent paper. But I can say that that is not that difficult and the idea is a little bit overlapped with that of the weak type estimate. Moreover, these two operator, operator norms are symmetric, one infinity and infinity and one. We may consider only one of them. So let's prove that the first operator norm is bounded by this uh, exponential growth with some arbitrary epsilon times LQ number of omega here. So let's prove this one. But this is actually equivalent to the next inequality. So the measure of this set is bounded by two to the epsilon mu times one over T, assuming 
L1 norm of F1 is one, L infinity norm of F2 is also one, and L q norm of omega is also one. So let's prove this inequality. The key idea is the Calderon sigma to decomposition. So F1 can be written as the uh, good function G1 plus the bad functions, the sum of B here at height t. So these functions satisfy the basic properties from Calderon sigma to decomposition. I mean, the measure of the union of Q is bounded by one over T because our height is T and each bad function is supported in Q and it satisfies the vanishing moment condition and L1 norm, of the, L1 norm of the bad function is bounded by T times the measure of Q and good function satisfy this estimate. Then for the good function part, uh, it is very easy to follow. So we have a good function now here. Then the measure of this set is bounded by uh, simply using the Chebyshev's inequality. It is bounded by one over T square times L2 norm of this function square. But we already know that uh, this boundedness. So L2 times L infinity to L2 of this operator. So it is bounded by this one, but we know uh, this omega is one, F2 is one. This is bounded by T because of this uh, the property of the good function. So definitely it is bounded by the constant one over T here. So this, the measure of this set is bounded by one over T. So we are done for the good function part. So now let's look at the, the other terms associated with the bad functions. So we need to estimate the measure of this set. We have bad functions here. Now we define Q star to be the concentric dilate of the cube Q by a factor of very large number. But in this talk, uh, 100 times square root of n, it is enough. Uh, since the measure of the union of Q star is bounded by one over T, okay? Uh, we need to estimate this, the measure of this set, which is uh, inside, which is inside the complement of the union of Q star that is bounded by two to the epsilon mu times one over T here. But by using the Chebyshev's inequality, the left-hand side is bounded by uh, one over T times L1 norm of this function. Now we just exchange this L1 norm and this sum. We can take out this sum outside here. And then, you know, the kernel k mu can be written as the sum of k mu gamma. So it is also bounded by this expression. Now we uh, separate this expression into two different parts, one of them dealing with the gamma, such that two to the gamma times LQ is less than one, another one with the remaining case here. So let's call the first one gamma one, the second one gamma two, and then our actual idea is we will obtain here for the first part, we obtain two to the gamma times the LQ to the positive power here. For the second one, we need the negative power here. Then this sum is definitely finite. The second one is also finite. So we deal with these two expressions separately. Uh, for the first one, I mean uh, two to the gamma times L is less than one, we will use the vanishing moment condition of the bad functions. So then this is equal to the, this integral. And then since the bad function has the variable y1, in this case, we have two different kernels with a different first variable. So x minus y1, x minus cq, here cq means the center of the cube q. Anyway, it is just a constant. So we have this one after using the vanishing moment condition and then take just the absolute value. Now, we first bound this one by one because it is bounded by L infinity norm of, of F2, which is one from assumption. And then, you know, the each kernel K gamma mu is a convolution with phi sub mu plus gamma and another kernel. So actually it is bounded by the next integral. But now we have the difference between two phi sub mu plus gamma with different variable, I mean different first variable, x minus y1 minus z1 
x minus c, q minus c over here. Now we notice that uh, this integral is bounded by simply just some exponential growth here times two to the gamma, the side length of q to the positive power here. I just use the difference between these two things. I mean, uh, the difference between y1 and cq here. Okay. Then what's left is the uh, these integrals. So it is bounded by the same constant times L1 norm of omega times L1 norm of the bad function here. But from our assumption, this is also finite, less than one. So we proved that this integral is bounded by some exponential growth times two to the gamma LQ to the very small number epsilon, but that is positive number times L1 norm of the bad function. Then by plugging this estimate into the definition of the gamma one, it is here. It is bounded by some small exponential growth times one over T times the sum of L1 norm of B times this one. Clearly the second one is finite because we have the positive power here. And this is also finite because of the property of the bad functions, it is here. So finally, we can bound the first two part, comma one is by two to the epsilon mu times one over t here. So then we are done here. So now let's look at the second one, comma two. For this one, uh, assume two to the gamma times uh, the side length of q is greater or equal to one. In this case, we simply take the absolute value of all integrands. Then it is bounded by this one. But uh, by taking, I mean, by estimating this one, uh, so this is bounded by L infinity norm, but that is one, okay? And original second variable is X minus Y2 minus Z1, uh, Z2. But since there is no other functions of variable on Z2, because we already bound this part here, uh, we can change the variable here. So y2 here. Then this integral is bounded by this integral right now. So uh, here we estimate the function theta. It is bounded by the product of these two integrals because uh, phi sub, uh, this function phi is Schwarz function. So this estimate is from just from the first variable. This is just from the second variable. Then the second integral is clearly uh, bounded by some constant because the denominator has a power greater than n. And for the first integral, we uh, observe that when x is outside the uh, dilation of q, but y1 is inside q, there is some gap between x and y1. Moreover, if z1 is less than equal to 2 to the minus gamma plus 1 with this condition, we can easily check that x minus y1 minus z1 is greater or equal to x minus cq. So it means that we can replace just the variable in this denominator by x minus cq. So we have this integral now. Then from a simple computation, it is bounded by just this uh, constant here. But the important thing here is we have negative power here. Then uh, we can bound just this function by two to the gamma times L Q to the negative power. So we have this inequality. Now by plugging this estimate into the definition of gamma two, we can bound gamma two by one over T times this integral or this sum. But you know, this is finite because we have negative power and this is also finite. So it is bounded by one over T. So this completes the proof of this weak type estimate. Uh, could you go to the previous uh, slide? Oh, sure. So there's already two power uh, minus mu, right? Uh, in the last. Oh yeah, but in this case, mu is positive number. So you can, we can yeah. ignore. So you get better, I mean, that's yeah, so, yeah, we have better uh, uh, upper bound here. Yeah. So it doesn't matter in this case, right? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. 
Now let's think about uh, the other part, I mean region two. So we assume the point one over P1 and one over P2 is inside region two. I mean, on this, in this triangle. Then suppose that Q is greater than maximum of these two numbers, four over three and P over two P minus one. Then we will actually prove that uh, this operator norm is bounded by two to the epsilon mu times L Q norm of omega. Uh, here we have exponential growth, not decay. But definitely we need the exponential uh, decay here. And, but actually we can uh, change this exponential growth to exponential decay by using some interpolation argument. Let me explain that, inter that technique here. So assume this is true, the blue estimate is true, true. Then please look at this picture. So we have the point one over P1 and one over P2 here. And then draw the line through this point. Then this line has the equation T1 plus T2 is equal to one over P. We draw another line slightly above the first line. So then uh, the equation of the second line is T1 plus T2 is equal to one over P tilde or some P tilde. So P tilde is definitely less than P because this second line is above the first line, but we can choose P tilde such that the maximum of four over three and P tilde over two P, two P tilde minus one, this value is between these two numbers. It is always possible because this maximum is strictly less than Q. So we have some very small gap between these two numbers, right? So we can choose P tilde here. And then we choose another point here, D, one over P1, one over R. So the same X, uh, the first variable. We also choose another point inside the region one. Uh, explicitly, it is one over P1, P1 minus one over two P1 here. So those three points lie on the same line. Then uh, from the previous case, I mean, since C is inside the region one, we already have this estimate at the point C with some decay here. And from the blue estimate, we have estimate the point D. But in this case, we have some exponential growth here. But since epsilon can be taken arbitrarily small, while this delta is some fixed number, by taking uh, epsilon sufficiently large, by interpolating these two results, we finally obtain this estimate for some positive number theta zero here. So we have some uh, exponential decay still have. Does it make sense? So actually uh, it suffices to show that this inequality holds. Okay, let's prove this one. Uh, so we assume P1 and P2 are between one and infinity and P is between one half and one because uh, it is on this line, uh, in this, on this triangle. And then we assume uh, it is greater than maximum of these two numbers. The idea is we will actually study the estimates at these two endpoints, one over P0 and one and one and one over P0. So in this case, one over P1 plus one over P2 is equal to one plus one over P0, which is equal to one over P. Then the condition on, mu, uh, condition on Q would be Q is greater than maximum of four over three and P0 over P0 minus one because of this identity. So then when you have the estimate at these two endpoints with some exponential growth, by interpolating, we can actually prove this estimate at the point on the line. So the proof can be reduced to the following proposition, which gives us the two endpoint estimates. So epsilon is any number between zero and one, mu is positive number, and P zero is between one and infinity. So one over P zero is here. Then we suppose that instead of the original one, I mean P over two P minus one, we assume Q is greater than maximum of four over three and P zero over P zero minus one here. Then uh, these two weak type estimate is true. Okay, let's prove this one. Uh, just to prove the first one, yeah. 
So this inequality is uh, equivalent to this one. As we did before, we may assume these guys are one, and then we need to prove this inequality. In this case, we have the power P0 over P0 plus one here and here, because the weak type space has the uh, parameter P0 over P0 plus one here. Then we apply the calderon segment uh, decomposition as before, so F1 can be written as the good function plus the bad functions. But in this case, our height would be T to the uh, P0 over P0 plus one, not T, okay? And then uh, those functions satisfy these properties. So we have minus P0 over P0 plus one, this power, and similarly, we also have this power and uh, power here. Uh, similar to the previous case, the good function part is very easy. We simply use the Chebyshev inequality. Then it is bounded by t to the minus two p zero over p zero plus one times uh, this norm to the this power. Now we observe that uh, this point is inside the region one. So from the previous result we already have this boundedness result of the L mu here. So it is bounded by this one here, but uh, this is one, and this is also one. And by using the property of the good function, we can bound this one by here. So we apply the similar argument, but uh, here we should notice that the condition Q is greater than four over three, it is required because of this inequality. Okay. In order to use this bounded estimate, we need Q is greater than four over three. So for a good function, uh, it is enough to assume Q is greater than four over three. We don't need P0 over P0 minus one. Okay. Now let's look at uh, the other terms, bad function part. Uh, since the measure of Q star, uh, the union of Q star is bounded by T to the minus P0 over P0 plus one, uh, we need to just obtain this inequality. So outside of the union here. Then by using the Chebyshev inequality, it is bounded by uh, T to the minus this power and integral of this power here. And then as we did before, we separate this expression based on the range of gamma. So first one has gamma such that two to the gamma L Q is less than one. The other one is greater or equal to one. Then let's call the first one new one, the second one new two here. So we have a similar structure. So now, and then uh, as we did before, uh, we will obtain two to the gamma L Q to the positive power here, negative power here. And for the first one, we use the property of the vanishing moment, I mean the vanishing moment the property of the bad function. For the second one, we use the gap between two variables. One of them is inside the cube, 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 cube. Another one is outside of the uh, dilation of the cube, cube. So let's look at the first part. Oh, okay. So by using the vanishing moment condition of the bed function, it is bounded by this integral. I skipped some process in this inequality, but we already uh, look at uh, the idea before. So it is bounded by the integral of the difference of these two pieces of mu plus gamma with different first variables. And then uh, in the previous case, we estimate this integral, but in this case, we estimate just this difference. So we need the pointwise estimate. So this difference is bounded by two to the epsilon mu, so some small uh, exponential growth times the same, I mean, two to the gamma LQ to the positive power here. And here we have another function mu. But I do not wanna define this function mu explicitly because it has very long expression. But in this case, we just need the condition that the L1 num of mu at the U with respect to the first variable is bounded by some constant uniformly in the second variable y1 and epsilon and mu plus gamma. 
it is a simple computation. And then times uh, this function with some sufficiently large L here. Then uh, by plugging this inequality, this pointwise estimate into this integral, we obtain this upper bound. So some exponential growth times positive number here, and then we have this integral. But definitely the second integral is bounded by the maximal function of F2. In that case, the uh, variable is X minus C2 here. So we can bound this one by uh, just the maximal function here. Now we apply the Helder's inequality in, in this integral over Z2. Then we have another maximal function here and then times L cunum of omega here. Now we can take this maximal function outside of the integral because it, does, it is not related to uh, the variable Z1. So now we have, this is bounded by some exponential growth times positive power times a function of X times another function of X. So the key idea here is we separate one function into two different function of X variables. One of the fundamental ideas in multilinear operator is uh, Helder's inequality. And for this part, we usually separate one function into several functions of the same variable, of the same variable X. Then we can apply the Helder's inequality. And this is that step. So right now we are ready to use the Helder's inequality because we have two separate functions here. So uh, U1 is bounded by, I take this power here for simplicity. So we have minus one here, epsilon mu, and then uh, L P0 over P0 plus one norm. But inside this norm, we have two different functions, this maximal function and this another sum here. Now we apply Helder's inequality. Then the first part is LP0 norm of this maximal function. The other one is L1 norm of this sum. For the first one, we apply the maximal inequality. So this is bounded by F2, uh, LP0 norm of F2, which is one from assumption. And then for the L1 norm, we take out this sum outside. And then by using the property of the bed function and the L1 norm of U, we can show that uh, finally obtain uh, this one here. I do not want to explain this one in detail, but those are simple computation. The key point is we have two different functions inside this norm and then apply the Helder's inequality. Then first one, for the first one, we apply the maximal inequality for hardly due to the maximal function. But for this one, we need the condition that Q prime is less than P0 which is equivalent to two, Q is greater than P0 minus over P0 minus one. So uh, as we discussed before, we assume Q is greater than maximum of four over three and P0 over P0 minus one. So this number is just for good function part. And this condition is just for bad function part. So we need the maximum of these two values. And then uh, by using the property of the bad functions, uh, we can easily check that uh, the other part, I mean, this L1 norm is finite as well. So we finally obtain this is bounded to this one. So we are done in this case. Okay. For the other part, I mean U2, we take the absolute value inside. So here. And then I uh, bound just this Schwarz function by the product of this function and this function. The first one is from the second variable. So I just split. And the second one is from the first variable with, uh, with some sufficiently large L and here and here. Then uh, the first one is bounded by a maximal function x minus c2, okay? So we have this maximal function here. And then for this integral, we use the fact that x is outside of the dilation of q, y is inside uh, of q. I mean, the y1 is inside. And then with this condition, 
we can show that x minus y1 minus z1 is greater equal to x minus cq. So we can replace this one by x minus cq as we did before. So actually, this integral is bounded by this function times L1 of the bad function. So we have this is bounded by uh, these functions. I plug everything there. And then uh, by using the Helder's inequality in this integral, we obtain uh, this maximal function and L q norm of omega here. So the, we, have a, we have the similar uh, key point here. I mean, I separate this function into two different functions. This is the first one. Another one is this maximal function. So we are ready to uh, use the Helder's inequality. So u2 is equal to t to the minus p0 over p0 plus 1. It is just the definition. And then by plugging the previous estimate into here, we have the product of two different functions, the maximal function and this sum here. So then by using the Helder's inequality, we, uh, we have the LP0 norm of this maximal function and this one here. Similarly, we can bound this LP0 norm by one by using the maximal inequality. And by using the property of this bad function, we can also bound the second one is also bounded by one here. So u2 is less than equal to t to the minus p0 over p0 plus one. Here we still need q prime is less than p0 for this maximal inequality. So we need q is greater than uh, this p0 over p0 minus one. Then we are done here. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, can, oh. can I ask a question here? Uh, so this condition uh, q bigger than p naught over p p naught minus one is this one? Uh, yeah, it's coming from the use of the maximal function. Sure. I mean, we have actually we have to estimate this norm and this norm, the second one. Yeah. But for the first one, we need or uh, we use the, the maximal inequality. So here you are decomposing uh, or performing the Calderon Zygmunt decomposition only on the first function, F1. Uh, if, if we also simultaneously do that for the second function, uh, what happens? Like, uh, because then this maximal function several, uh, can be avoided most likely. Usually the Calderon Zygmunt theory and um, decomposition, uh, that is applied to L1, I mean L1 function. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we have two, two different variables. I mean, L1, LP0, here P0 is not one. Yes. To LP0 over P0 plus one. So I'm not sure about the decomposition for this part. It is not one. All right. But uh, can we take P0 equals to one? In that case, if... Uh... You mean L1 times L1? Like this one? Yes. Actually, I, I applied, but uh, there was some error. So I did not obtain the desired result for this one. Uh, yeah. Uh, I do not remember exactly, but there is some technical issue. So yeah, I, I think it was not applied. I see. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a very good question, because we can apply this kind of argument to uh, to generalize this to multilinear operator. I mean, for example, L1 times L1 times like this one. Mm -hmm. But I do not obtain this kind of things because uh, it has the same problem. So yes. when you have two different Calderon uh, decompositions, then yeah, there was some errors. So I have no idea about that case, yeah. Uh, maybe here some some uh, p averages instead of this one average uh, and try. I mean, one has to see whether uh, one can take instead of one average uh, some p average like p not average and then see what is the Calderon Zygmunt uh, decomposition corresponding to that. So I, I guess we may apply the same argument for just for like this. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure about the more L1 norms there. Yeah. Yeah. How does one then use this if I have the both Calderon Zygmunt decomposition, then there will be cross terms, right? On the bad and bad part. Pardon? Oh, sorry, I cannot hear. Could you please say loudly, please? Yeah. 
Well, uh, if I am uh, trying to do even the Calderon Jigman decomposition for the both F1 and F2, then uh, I will land up uh, with the good, 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 bad, bad, bad. Okay, one sec, please. Right. Good function part, right? So, if you know, coming back to the sort of question, so when I am having the both calderon jigman decomposition on both the function, F1 mm -hmm. and F2, then mm -hmm. I am going to get G1, G2, G1, B1. Yeah, B1, yeah good function has no problem. Yeah, that, yeah. that it so, so then the, there will be two bad parts. That's exactly right. If we have a bad function and bad function, it, it is much more difficult to write. Okay, so please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other question here? Okay, so now let's look at some open problems. So, so one, one question, I mean, oh, so here, uh, uh, when we are, uh, when you are dealing with this bad part B1Q, so essentially uh, only the cancellation part you are using of this P1Q to get a size estimate of the kernel that is trivial. And uh, 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 apart from uh, that, you are pushing the mod uh, of B1Q all the time inside the integral. You mean right? here? Uh, yeah, even, even here, this the mod of B1Q I want. So is it a kind of the bilinear thing? Because we are not using any cancellation of B1Q uh, any in further analysis, except getting certain size estimate. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, because could you please say again? I... Dealing with uh, all, it, all in your entire proof, I mean, we are doing with mod of B1Q, right? Uh, the sound the sound is not the sound is not, not so uh, maybe i can try what he's saying is that you are using modulus of b1q mm -hmm. you're not using the cancellation that's what he mean he means to us i use oh, he, okay this inequality i use i use the cancellation so we have the difference between these two things this is from just the cancellation condition of this one because this is, this is this this is the Hermander type condition you are using the cancellation, right? I mean, Hermander mm. type of condition you are getting with the CQ, and mm -hmm. uh, then you get a control over this difference with the growth. That's where. Oh. So I just to change this one by the, some constant here. It is just the, the, the center of the cube Q. Uh, please, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, it is, it is just from the, uh, the cancellation condition of the bad functions. Because without this absolute value, okay. the sec second part disappeared because of the cancellation condition of the bad functions. And then to estimate this one, we apply the L1 norm of the bad function. I mean here. Please, I mean, go ahead. Sorry, the sound is. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think he said uh, it's fine. Yes, you can go, uh, yeah. go further. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So now, so far, we have proved that uh, when P1 and P2 are between 1 and infinity and P is between 1 half and infinity, we proved this estimate if uh, Q is greater than maximum of these two numbers. Uh, our, my first question is what about uh, multilinear extensions? That's this one. We just considered a bilinear operator. And for the multilinear extensions, we already know that this initial estimate. So it is bounded from L2 times L2 to L2 over M with this operator norm LQ norm over omega for Q is greater than 2M over M plus one. It is already proved, but I'm not sure about the generalization of uh, this estimate. 
I guess we obtained a similar range of Q, but uh, I, I have no idea right now. Another question is what about the endpoint estimates? In the proof, we considered the endpoint estimate for, I mean, L mu here. But in this case, we have some exponential growth, not decay. So the, our argument does not give us the endpoint estimate like such as this kind of things, a weak type estimate and BM estimate. So uh, my second question is what about this kind of endpoint estimates? I think it, those are much, much difficult, yeah. And then next question is what about the improvement of the initial estimate? Uh, it is known that this is bounded by LQ norm or Q is greater than four over three. Then what about uh, this norm here? I mean, when Q is equal to exactly four over three. If that is false, what about the Lorentz uh, extensions here? Or what about L four over three log of L based on the result in the linear case? So these are three questions. And uh, another one is, we can also define maximal singular integral operator L omega star, which is defined the supremum of this quantity. For the original operator, we have here the limit, but now we have the supremum here. Uh, it is also known that it is about, uh, I mean, we have this initial estimate where Q is greater than 2M over M plus one. Then what about the bilinear extension? I mean, the generalization of this kind of estimate or what about the multilinear extensions? And the last question is, uh, the sharpness of uh, the condition Q is greater than four over three for the bilinear operators. And uh, generally, what about the sharpness of this one? Uh, so far, it is known that when Q is less than MN minus one over MN minus one over P, then there exists, so this is counter example, there exists an odd function omega in LQ such that the corresponding multilinear operator is not bounded. But there are a very huge gap between these numbers and this number. So I'm wondering if the boundedness is still true when Q is between these two numbers. So those are the, some open problems I have now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for a, a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. So are there any questions? Could you go to the slide of your first figure where you are comparing your result with graphical? Oh, which one? Uh, he's saying the, uh, the um, figure which, uh, where you were comparing the results. Okay. Uh, it's <laughs> beginning, right? Yeah. Here, right? Uh, uh, not, sorry, sorry, not this one. Yeah, here, right? Yeah, I think so. Oh. <laughs> I think uh, the person who was asking his connection went bad and, okay, now he's joined again. Just one minute, yeah, he's joined. Oh, recently, uh, I, I need to mention that recently this condition, Q is greater than P over two P minus one, that is sharp. Yeah, we proved this, uh, we constructed some counter example for this one, but I'm not sure about the sharpness of the condition Q is greater than four over three. Yeah, he's here. Uh, uh, yeah, my laptop was shut down, sorry. So here in this figure, the middle figure, mm -hmm. Uh, that for Q greater than four by three, uh, Graphacos and other mathematician, they have proved this region, boundedness in this region. Mm -hmm. But I think you must have seen the paper 
of Graphacos and two other mathematicians where they have proved sparse bounded sparse domination of bilinear uh, graph singular integral operator for mm -hmm. q greater than four by three. Yeah. So can we get a better region than this small triangle from their result? You mean on this triangle? I think yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We so in this picture we already have that one here. Yeah, of course. I mean, from there we will not get the full region. There is some restriction yeah, yeah. on P one P two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think we can get a better region than this small triangle in the middle figure. Anyway, I mean, this result is uh, much better than that result. Mm, actually, okay, currently uh, we are, wait, wait. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, currently uh, we guess that this is sharp. I mean, Q is greater than four over three is sharp, but we do not construct the example yet, but uh, we guess this one. So I think we cannot improve this range uh, anymore here. Yeah, this is fine. I was talking about the range of P1, P2 with same Q. Q is you, mean the, you mean the P1 Q. is less than one? Uh, not this less is than one. This is the older range P1 and P2. Okay. This is the range of one over P1 and one over P2. This square covers all the range. Yeah, yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what I was saying that from the uh, sparse domination result for Q greater than four by three, we can get a uh, region where this operator is bounded from LP1 cross LP2 to LP, where mm -hmm. P1, P2 lies outside this small triangle in the middle figure that half comma zero, zero comma half and half half. I think we can get mm -hmm. a better better triangle, I mean, slightly larger triangle than this triangle. That was my question. But of course yeah. we will not get the full full rectangle or full square. That is- yeah, sure, actually. Actually, our argument is based on the result on this right triangle. So if we have the much better result on this right triangle, definitely, yeah, we can improve the more. I mean, the same range here, I think. Yeah, Q is uh, same range. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. So if there is better range, of course, we can obtain the better range here as well. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Yeah, so it is just from the initial estimate, yeah. Okay, I, I have another question that uh, from uh, from the rough singular integral operator, so the bilinear one. So can you get some estimates for uh, uh, the bilinear Bochner rees at the critical index? Uh, I actually, I haven't thought about <laughs> the problem. I haven't thought about the Bachner rees operator work. Uh, actually, I start this kind of the object uh, two years before, and I studied the rope singular integral operator and multiply operator, and a little bit pseudo differential operators. So I have no idea yet about the Buckner Richter list of operators. Yeah. I, I have seen for the linear part, um, mm -hmm. you know, when um, people proved the sparse bounds for the rough singular, uh, they also proved it uh, for the Buckner Rees at the critical index. So uh, I think perhaps one could do something. But is it, uh, does it consider just the range? I mean, P is also greater than one, not the whole range? Uh, no, for the linear I mean, part, I think. Um, okay, yeah. linear yeah. part, it is not a big, yeah, big, not big problem, but yeah. in, in the bilinear case, uh, I think, I'm not sure, but in many cases, we have these kind of restrictions. All of them are greater than one. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
it is just the, this range. Uh, just this triangle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not sure about the results for the Buckner-Lich, but yeah, yeah, I have no idea about yeah Buckner-Lich operators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I say, Joseph, that is already known <laughs> at the for critical the, uh, at the critical index. Yeah. yeah. Okay, for all range. Uh, yes, I think except the endpoint. Ah, uh, okay. At one one half. Okay, okay. You and mean by, on the whole range, right? By whom? I think by yes only. <laughs> no, because... no. <laughs> no, I meant going below the. <laughs> Yeah, sure, of course. That is, uh, yeah, when P is less than one, uh, how about? Okay, so I'm not sure that is the usually very difficult part because if all, all these parameters and P are greater than one, we may use the kind of the duality argument. So, but when P is less than one, we cannot do that. So we have we cannot oh yeah we have very restricted uh, tools so I'm not sure there is some uh, some method to deal with uh, this kind of things so we have to prove directly not using the duality argument in this mm -hmm. case yeah. yeah thank you very much for okay. the thank you. Really nice. uh, I have a small question uh, so can we go to your last slide on the open question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So for this maximal operator, okay. Or what should be the strategy like the original uh, in the linear case, Duan uh, de Cochia and Rubio, they mm -hmm. have uh, taken that. Uh, into the Kotler type inequality and broke it into the three parts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, what is the kind of the decomposition? Have you tried uh, this? Uh, and what is the problem in this? Mm, okay. Uh, compared with the linear case, the structure of the bilinear operator is very, very different. Mm -hmm. So even with the bilinear operator, I mean, M is a two. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure, but okay. We have the result for L omega, but this argument cannot be applied to L omega star, even in bilinear case. So I can say that just the linear and bilinear operator has very, very different structure. That is the uh, very difficult part here. And actually, the main argument, uh, main difficulty is in the linear case, we have a kind of very nice tool uh, called the Plancher's identity. Mm -hmm. But in the bilinear or multilinear case, we do not have the Plancher's identity. That is the main difficulty to deal with the uh, multilinear operator. Uh, I mean, for I mean for general cases. So in this case, uh, we have the same uh, difficulty here because of the uh, the lack of the Pleasure's identity. Is there any so, idea that what should be the Kotler for maximum value? Um, I'm not sure about that one, but I was told that uh, the Grafakos, the Professor Grafakos already tried, probably. Okay. But I think it does not give us the desired result. Yeah, yeah. Because of very different structure. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, are there any more questions? So if not, uh, let's thank the speaker for a really nice talk. You can uh, unmute and clap yourself or...
click on the icon. Whatever. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so today, as I told, today was the last uh, lecture of the series. So uh, so we'll see uh, see you after maybe a month or so. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you for organizing such nice series of talks.